Greetings, this is Professor Roman. Let's continue the Ring Theory Lectures. We're ready now to move on to Chapter 2 of the book, Ideals and Quotient Rings. If you have studied group theory, then you will know that among all the subgroups of a given group, there's one type that's particularly important, the normal subgroup. As you know, then, these are the subgroups that can be used to form quotient groups. In the theory of rings, the role of the normal subgroup is played by a structure known as an ideal. An ideal, I, in a ring R, is by definition a subgroup of the additive group of R that is closed not only under multiplication by elements of the ideal, but also has a property has the property that the product of any element of the ideal and any element in the ring, anywhere in the ring, must be in the ideal. So in symbols, if A is in the ideal and R is in the ring, then the product RA and the product AR lie in the ideal. In informal terms, it's kind of like a super closure under multiplication. That's not a technical term. This might help you remember what's going on here. It's kind of an absorption thing, however you want to think of it. Now comes the rub. In the more general theory of rings that are not required to have a multiplicative identity, the definition of a subring is somewhat different than the one we gave. It specifies only that the subset or sub uh, ring be an additive subgroup of the ring that's closed under multiplication. Obviously, you can't require closure under the identity if there isn't an identity. So, an ideal is a special type of subring. It's a subring that has this super closure property. However, in the theory of rings with identity, which is the subject of this course, things are different. When identity elements are required, then all subrings must by definition inherit the identity of the parent ring. But this superclosure property implies that if the identity is in the ideal, then every element of R belongs to the ideal. In other words, the ideal is all of the ring. So, in the theory of rings with identity, our theory, proper ideals are not subrings. And that's what it is. This isn't a serious problem. It's just something we have to recognize. It's perhaps you might consider it a slight inconvenience. For example, we're going to have two different correspondence theorems one for subrings and one for ideals, but they're going to look very similar. Now, rather than simply take the definition of an ideal that I just gave you on faith, I, mean, I don't like giving you definitions on faith. I prefer to motivate them when I can. We can do that here. We can ferret out the proper analog of normal subgroup by recalling that normal subgroups are precisely the kernels of group homomorphisms. A subgroup is normal if and only if it's the kernel of a group homomorphism. So we should take a look at kernels of ring homomorphisms. Th those are probably the analog of normal subgroups. So if sigma is a ring homomorphism from R to S, then its kernel is closed under addition, it's closed under negatives, it's closed under multiplication. 
and and these are the reasons right here, which I'll let you ponder. You should write this yourself rather than reading it. In particular, the kernel of sigma is an additive subgroup of R. But since sigma of 1 equals 1, the multiplicative identity doesn't belong to the kernel. So the kernel's not a subring of R. So that's our first hint that ideals, kernels of ring homomorphisms, are not subrings. They don't contain the identity. At least um, not in the case it, for the zero homomorphism. Well, the zero map's not a homomorphism, so I don't have to worry about that, actually. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, oops, there we go. If we take an element A in the kernel of sigma, and if R is any element of the ring, then these products, A, R, and R, A, do belong to the kernel. In other words, the kernel has this super closure property under multiplication, and this is the reason. Sigma of A, R is sigma of A, sigma R, but sigma A is zero, so we get zero. Same thing the other way around. So this is precisely the property I described to you earlier as the definition of, a cur of, a, um, of an ideal. If A is in the kernel of sigma and R is any ring element, then the products in either order belong to the kernel. So the kernels have this superclosure or absorption property, uh, however you want to think of it. So now we can give the official definition of an ideal, uh, and it's fully motivated through its connection with uh, the its analog of normal subgroups. Let R be a ring and let I be a subgroup of the abelian group R. We're going to do this for non-commutative rings, so we can define left and right ideals just as we did for identities and uh, inverses. I is a right ideal of R if it's closed under multiplication on the right by any ring element. So A is in the ideal, R is any ring element, AR is in the ideal. And this can be written uh, a little bit more concisely, I guess you'd say. A is an I implies A capital R is a subset of I. And a left ideal is an analogous. It's R A is a subset of I. Multiplication on the left by any element. The product gets absorbed into the ideal. And a two-sided ideal, which we generally would just call an ideal, is both a left and right ideal. So the concise form looks like this. A is an I implies R A R is a subset of I. And this is, of course, the set of all products, little, a, little r, a, little s, where r and s can be anywhere in the ring. So, um, since this is the analog, an ideal is the analog of a normal subgroup, we'll use the same symbol that we use for normal subgroups in that course. And that looks like this. It's a um, sideways triangle with a line under it. Proper ideal looks like this. The notation here is the same as we have used before in group theory. We're not going to need a, a specific notation for one-sided ideals because we're not going to be studying them very carefully. And of course, for a commutative ring, uh, left and right ideals are, are two-sided ideals, so you don't even need that concept of one-sided ideal. Examples, every ring has two ideals. The trivial ideal, notice that this is not a subring because it doesn't contain the multiplicative identity, and the whole ring. 
if R is a commutative ring and A is an element of R, then this set of, all, of R times A, in other words, the set of all little r a's, as the little r ranges over the ring, we use this notation, is an ideal of r called the principal ideal generated by the element a. In group theory, we would refer to this as the cyclic subgroup generated by a. And in linear algebra, we would refer to it as the one-dimensional subgroup, uh, subspace generated by A. As we're going to see, principal ideals play a very large role in the study of rings. Just as a simple example, divisibility can be expressed in terms of principal ideals. A divides B if and only if the ideal generated by B is contained in the ideal generated by A. Something you should prove. And so A and B are mutual divisors if and only if the two principal ideals are equal. Another example The matrix ring M2 of R, so these are 2 by 2 real matrices, and this is a subset S consisting of such matrices where the second row is all zeros. Uh, this is an additive subgroup of R, and if we multiply <coughs> this matrix, a typical element of S, by any matrix, in the ring, we get this matrix, which still belongs to S. And so S is a right ideal. Right multiplication by an arbitrary element stays in the, in the ideal for the subset. <clears throat> but if you multiply on the left by an arbitrary matrix, you'll get something that looks like this, and that's not in S unless AY equals BY equals zero. So S is not a left ideal. So again, let me emphasize that in the theory of rings with identity, ideals and subrings are different gadgets. In the theory of rings with identity, no proper ideal of R can contain the identity element, or in fact any unit of R. So if I is a proper ideal of R, then I intersect the <clears throat> a group of units of R is empty. And we have shown that the kernel of a ring homomorphism is an ideal of R. As with groups, the converse also holds. Every ideal is the kernel of a ring homomorphism. <clears throat> and these homomorphisms are the natural projection maps that we encountered in both linear algebra and group theory. But um, we can't define them for rings quite yet because we haven't discussed quotient rings, which we're going to do later in the chapter. But this notwithstanding, we now know that the analog in the theory of rings with identity of a normal subgroup is the ideal, and that proper ideals are not subrings. It's also worth noting separately that fields do not have any non-trivial proper ideals whatsoever <clears throat> because if F is a field and I is a non-trivial ideal of F, <clears throat> then for any non-zero R in the ideal, R inverse R is in the ideal, but that's the identity. So then the ideal has to be all of F. Here's a definition that's the direct analog of simple group. A ring is simple if it has no non-trivial proper ideals. And I'm going to leave the following result 
uh, the, the proof of the following result for you. A non-zero commutative ring R is a field if and only if it's simple. Okay. <clears throat> Let's take a look now at the family of ideals of a ring. So that is ideals of R. That's the notation we're going to use. And these are two-sided ideals. Even if the ring is not commutative, uh, we're only interested right now in two-sided ideals. Just as it is the case for the subrings of a ring, for the subspaces of a vector space, for the subgroups of a group, the ideals of a ring are uh, form an intersection structure. So the intersection of any family of ideals is again an ideal. We know from our study of groups that the intersection of a family of ideals is at least an additive subgroup. And here is the proof that the intersection is in fact, uh, that has that super closure property that defines an ideal. And I think you should do this for yourself so I won't go through it. <clears throat> In any case, since the family of ideals is an intersection structure, it is a complete lattice where meet is intersection as usual, and the join of a family F is the meet of all of the upper bounds for F, all of the ideals that are upper bounds for the family. Now, this is a good time for you to give some thought to the question of what the meet and join of the empty family of ideals looks like. <clears throat> now the previous description of the join of ideals, the one I just gave you, is not very constructive. So let's take a more constructive viewpoint. If we have a family F of ideals of a ring R, then <clears throat> the set of all sums of elements taken from the various ideals, and the, these don't have to be from different ideals, just somewhere in the union of all the ideals. These sums form an additive group under R. That's easy to check. Moreover, this set of sums, which I'm calling J, is an ideal because if R is any ring element and we have a sum in J, then the product looks like this. But let's say X1 is in one of the ideals of the family, so Rx1 is in that same ideal. <clears throat> so this linear combination is, in fact, a member of J. So <clears throat> J is in fact an ideal. <clears throat> Here's the, uh, the other equation we need to check, multiplying by R on the right. Now, <clears throat> since all these sums have to be in any ideal that contains the members of the family F, it follows that J is the smallest ideal of R, an extra symbol here, that uh, contains the ideals in the family. Okay. This has to be fixed to I sub K. Okay. So J is the join of F, the set of all sums where the terms of the sum come from any of the ideals in the family. So here is the um, definition of the sum of a family of ideals. It's the set of all sums of elements from the union of the ideals. A finite family, we just write it this way. And what we now know is that the join of a family of ideals is the intersection I'm sorry, the meet of F is the intersection, the join of F is the sum 
Well, we may as well pause here and ask, what could we say about the union of a family of ideals? We address this question uh, about subspaces of a vector space. What can you say about the union of subspaces? Um, <clears throat> I don't remember, frankly, whether I addressed the issue of the union of subgroups of a group, something you might want to think about. There's not a whole lot we can say in general about the union of a family of ideals except in one very important special case, and this applies to subgroups and it applies to subspaces as well. If F is a chain of ideals, remember that a chain is a totally ordered set. And here we're talking about set inclusion in the family of ideals. Uh, then the union is an ideal. And here's the reason. It, it's the same essentially the same proof that we would do for vector spaces or groups. If A and B are in the union, then A is in one of the ideals in the family, and B is in one of the ideals of the family. And since the family's totally ordered, it's a chain, we're assuming, one of these two is contained in the other. We may as well say I sub K is contained in I sub J. And therefore, a minus B and RA, where R is any element of the ring, are contained in the bigger of the two ideals. And that's contained in the union. Okay. So this whole argument works only because we have a chain of ideals, so given any two ideals, one is contained in the other. <clears throat> so here's a summary. Let F be a family of ideals of a ring R. The meat of the family is the intersection. The join is the sum. And if F is a chain, then the join of F is in fact the union. Okay. How about the ideal generated by a subset of the ring, non-empty subset. So suppose X is a non-empty subset of a ring R. I, uh, you should be, as we go through this discussion, be reminded very closely of this same process for groups and even for vector spaces. Okay. If X is a non-empty subset of a ring R, what would we mean by the ideal generated by X? Well, the definition is in the same spirit as it is for groups and for vector spaces. Let X be a non-empty subset of a ring R. The right or left or two-sided, whatever we're interested in, ideal generated by X is the smallest right or left or two-sided ideal that contains X. So that's the definition. Not everybody uses this definition. I like it because you can replace the word ideal by, by a subgroup or subspace, and you get the same thing. You get the, you get the definition. Uh, <clears throat> now, since the family of all, neither right, left, or two-sided ideals, is an intersection structure, we immediately can say that if X is a non-empty subset of a ring R, then the right or left or two-sided, whatever we're dealing with, ideal generated by X is the intersection of all of the same type of ideals of R that contain X. And we use this notation that we used before for groups and vector spaces and similar notations in the finite case, the ideal generated by a single element is called the principal ideal generated by X. Okay. <clears throat> As is the case for the subring generated by X, you know, this definition doesn't shed any light on the nature of the elements. So, when we give these sorts of uh, 
existence results. And this is often the case. We don't get much insight into the constructive nature of the, of the object. So we have to do some more work to deal with that. <clears throat> of course, x is contained in the ideal generated by x. And since this is an ideal, if we take any element of x and any pair of elements of r, then rxs has to be in the ideal generated by capital X. Or, again, more succinctly, capital R X capital R is a subset of the ideal generated by X. Now this ideal is also closed under addition. So sums of this form have to be in the ideal. Or, again, we can write that this way. But this set of sums is an ideal of R. And therefore, it is the ideal generated by X. It's the smallest ideal containing X. So the elements of the ideal generated by X are formed by choosing any finite, non-empty, multi-set of elements of x. Duplicates are allowed, and multiplying each element on both sides by any element of r. Okay. So we get these little products of three elements here, and then taking their sums. And you need to ask yourself the question, why do we have to allow duplicates? Why, why can't we just say, x1 comes from one ideal, x2 comes from a different ideal, and so on. Okay, this is something worth thinking about. It's a wrinkle we haven't seen before. Now, if r is a commutative ring, we don't need to multiply the elements of x on both sides. So we get a little bit of a simpler formulation here rx1 through rxn. These are, by the way, I probably said this somewhere, the, the principal ideals generated by x1 through xn. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm going to refer to an expression like this, if I need to, as a linear combination of x1 through xn. So the ideal here is the set of all linear combinations of elements from the <coughs> various um, linear combination of elements from X. So here is the summary then of what we've just been discussing. Examples. If we take a polynomial P of X, then the set of all multiples of P of X is the principal ideal generated by P of X. Here is a matrix A belonging to the family, the ring of two by two real matrices. The principal ideal generated by A has to contain all these matrices, P, A, Q, where P and Q are arbitrary matrices, and then also all sums of such matrices. So for example, this matrix, this one is A, and these are just anything. And same thing here. Here's A again, and these are anything from the ring. Uh, so this is an example of an element from the ideal generated by this matrix A. There's the complication here, complication we saw earlier in general, comes from the fact that the ring might not be commutative. So we have to multiply the generators on both sides. And if I say anything more about that, I'll give away why you do have to uh, allow duplicates in your combinations. <clears throat>
One of the most important special types of integral domains are those in which every ideal is principal. So we have a definition, an integral domain R is a principal ideal domain if every ideal of R is principal. For example, the ring of integers is a principal ideal domain. Any ideal I of the integers is generated by the smallest positive integer A that is contained in the ideal. And this is the usual familiar division argument we used in the group theory course several times. If x is an element of the ideal, we can write x equals qa plus r. The remainder r is greater than or equal to 0 and less than the divisor a. And so r is equal to x minus qa. X is in I, A is in I, and therefore QA is in I, and so the difference is in I. But R is less than the, and it's non-negative, less than the smallest positive element in the ideal, therefore R must be zero. And so X is a multiple of A, and therefore in this principal ideal. <clears throat> so any element in the ideal I belongs to the principal ideal generated by A, and conversely. So these are equal. The ring f square bracket x of polynomials over a field is a principal ideal domain. Since each non-zero ideal I is generated by the monic polynomial of smallest degree contained in the ideal. And the proof here uh, mimics this proof I just gave you for the integers, so I'll let you fill that in. The ring F double square bracket X of formal power series over a field F is a principal ideal domain. If I is an ideal of F double square bracket X, then consider the element P of X of I of smallest order, which must be at least one since P of X is not a unit. If you recall, the order of a formal power series is the smallest exponent of X that appears with non-zero coefficient. So if p of x has order k, then p of x has this form. So you see here, uh, a k is non-zero. k is the smallest exponent that appears in the power series. <clears throat> and I can factor out x to the k, and the rest is q of x, and that is a unit because it's constant coefficient is a, is a unit, okay, is a non-zero element of the field, the base field, so it's a unit. So <clears throat> x to the k is p of x, q of x inverse, and that belongs to the ideal i, because <clears throat> uh, I was the, is, is in the ideal I. It's, it's the element of smallest order. Okay. So that means the ideal generated by X to the K is contained in I. But if F of X is a polynomial in I, then its order is greater than or equal to that of P of X. And so x to the k divides f of x. So all the terms in f of x are x to a power at least as big as k. So f of x 
belongs to the ideal generated by x to the k. It's a multiple of x to the k. And so i, in fact, is the ideal generated by x to the k, and, which is principal. <clears throat> Here's an example of a ring that's not a principal ideal domain, and that is the ring of polynomials over the integers. Take a look at this ideal generated by x and the integer 2. So it looks like the elements look like ax plus b, uh, well, b2 or 2b. This is not principal. If it were principal, if it was generated by a single polynomial, then we would have to have, call it p of x, we would have to have 2 would belong to the ideal, would have to be a multiple of p of x. q of x is an integer polynomial, but that implies, because we're dealing with integer coefficients here, that p of x is either positive 1, negative 1, or positive 2, or negative 2. But p of x can't be either one of these, because they're units, and then p of x would generate the entire ring. Okay. And this is also not possible, because x is not in the ideal generated by 2. So this is not a principal ideal. It's not generated by a single polynomial. Any ideal i of zn is generated by the smallest positive integer a that is contained in the ideal. <clears throat> and we have this division argument again. So every ideal of zn is principal. I'm going to leave it to you to answer the question, is Zn a principal ideal domain? Okay. <clears throat> Finally, note that if x1 through xn are elements of a ring, then the sum of the principal ideals is precisely the smallest ideal containing these elements, and so we have this equation. Could have discussed this earlier, but I, for some reason, postponed it to this point. <clears throat> so we've talked about the sum of ideals, it's, and we've talked about the ideal generated by a set of elements from the ring. What about the product of ideals? How should we define the product ij of two ideals, i and j, in a ring? Well, we want the product to be an ideal of r, and we also want it to contain the individual little productlets ij, where i is in capital I and j is in capital J. So it would be reasonable to define the product ij to be the smallest ideal containing these products. And that looks like, as we've seen before, that looks like um, uh, express, well, this should be a, a union here. Um, <clears throat> you have to fix that a bit. Um, it, it's okay the way it is. This, this is any ring element times I1, J1 times any ring element. And so you, you have this is a set, and you add all these sets together. Okay. <clears throat> but since I and J are ideals, if you put a little... Uh, 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 say A and R, you put that here, and B and R, you put that here, you have A, I1, J1, B, but 
AI1 is in the ideal I, and so AI1 is also in I, and J1B belongs to the ideal J, so th this, there's a collapse here, okay? I, I wrote it here, but I used R and S. R, I, J, S. <clears throat> this product is simply an I prime, J prime. Because the R gets absorbed into the ideal I and the J is, a, uh, the S is absorbed into the ideal capital J. So you can simplify this expression to make it look like this. It's the set of sums of products. But you have to pay attention to the I factor comes before the J factor. And more generally, if we have N ideals, then their product, I1 through IN, is the ideal generated by the products of this form and uh, this is little i1 through little in. So it's the set consisting of all sums of products of this form. Because again, we have the absorption of the leading coefficient and the final coefficient. So I'm going to leave it as an exercise for you to show that the distributive law holds for ideals. And so we have this expression, and also that for principal ideals in a commutative ring, the product of two principal ideals generated by A and B is the principal ideal generated by the product AB.